So yeah, I'm going to talk about Quebecois children's literature. First thing um, is I've been reading in French for the last 25, 30 years. Read in, started reading uh, English Canadian literature when I moved here in 2004, but then realized that I had read some of it already because there are some translations. So I'm going to talk about that as well because I think it's interesting to see what actually travels between the languages in Canada. So um, I like to start with a quiz to see what you know about French Quebecois children's lit uh, and about Cana English Canadian children's literature as well. So which English book was the first novel for children to be translated into French and is still in print and widely read from coast to coast? Judy, you're not allowed to answer. Um, <laughs> Any guess? Sorry? When was it written? Oh, early 20th century? Yes. Adam Green Gable. So it was first translated in, uh, in 1925 in French in Switzerland. Then um, another translation in France in 64. And the first Canadian translation in 1986. Uh, it was a co-publishing between a large Quebecois publisher, Quebec Amérique, and a smaller um, PEI publisher called Ragway Press. Um, it's still very well known in French, and I mean everywhere else as well, in many, many languages. Um, can you identify the two books that are translation of novel written by well-known Quebecois author? So two of those are actually written in English and two of those were written in French originally and they are translations. So the first one is words that start with B, this side of the sky, the road to Schlieffa, and a perfect gentle night. So what are the two that are translation? What are the two that are not translation? You can go back. It's not a translation, I agree with you. It's not a translation, it's Kit Pearson's, I don't know if it's a more recent book, but it's the most recent that I've read for sure. Um, what's the other one that is in English? Sorry? Yeah, Word That Start With B by Vicky Van Sickle, who is a former MECL uh, student. So that's um, been published quite recently. So the two that are translated are This Side of the Sky, which was written by Marie-France Nébert. Um, and this is, there's a mistake in the date. This is not, it should read 2003 and 2006. So it was first published in 2003 and then translated in 2006. And then uh, The Road to Schlieffa. So I don't know if you've read The Road to Schlieffa. <coughs> I'm a big advocate for that book. I've been talking about it ever since I moved here, I think. Written by Michel Marino, won the Governor General Award. And it's a very, very interesting story about friendship, about um, a boy from Lebanon who moves to Montreal during the Civil War in Lebanon in the, 80, in the 90s. And then uh, through flashback, we learn what happened to him while he was still in Lebanon. So it was well received in French, um, not as well known in English, but still you can still f easily find it in print these days. And if the other one, this side of the sky, uh, is about Mona, who has a sister who is, uh, have a mental handicap, and it's from a, she's in a small town, a remote location, and it's a very poetic kind of uh, reading. So both in French and English, it's a very poetic language. And there's a very good review for This Side of the Sky in CM Magazine, so if ever you want to have a bit more about this book, you can check it out. So which YA novel and translator won the 2009 Governor General Award, Literary Award for Translation from French to English? Good for Nothing, so those are all translation, but only one won the Governor General Award. So Good for Nothing, translated by Shirley Tanaka. Waiting for Jasmine, uh, which translated by Sheila Fishman. In the Key of Do, translated by Suzanne Uriou. Or Pieces of Me, translated by Suzanne Uriou. So which one won the Governor General Award in 2009 for translation? I have a few faces like, you want to try? <laughs> um, Judy? No. It was, yeah, Pieces of Me. Pieces of Me was written by um, Charlotte Gingras. 
1998, and interestingly, it was translated more than 10 years later. I have no idea what happened to that book in those 10 years. I've actually emailed Charlotte Jane Grain, and she's like, no idea what happened, why it was finally translated. Um, and Suzanne Oriou won the Governor General Award for Translation, and it's the only book for YA for children that has ever won the Governor General Award for Translation. So it's usually an adult book that wins that award. Um, so the other ones, Good for Nothing is a translation of Michel Noël. Uh, then Waiting for Jasmine is a book by François Gravel. And then In the Key of Doe um, is another book by Carol Fréchette. So how much, how many, for those of you who keep the scores, how many answers did you get? You don't have to tell me. <laughs> Just, <laughs> um, I think it's interesting that when I moved here, I didn't know much about English Canadian literature and knew much more about uh, literature from France. Really didn't know much about, except the few translations that I had read. So there's very something that's happening in Canada where there isn't that communication, that translating between the French and English. And French publishing is mostly in Quebec, but there are also some publisher in almost every provinces um, that publishes in French. I haven't found one in BC. But there's a few in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, in Manitoba, quite a, quite a lot in Ontario that publishes in French. And then New Brunswick has some, Nova Scotia has one at least. I haven't found one in PEI and, and um, Newfoundland, but most provinces, I don't know about the territory, uh, but most provinces do publish books in French and English. And there's very few translation and very few understanding of what's going on um, in French. So I'm going to try to go back in history for a minute, just tell you how um, publishing in Quebec started early 20th century. I'm just going to look at my notes for that. <coughs> so publishing for children's literature took off uh, in Quebec at the beginning of the 20s, the 1920s. And until the 50s, beginning of the 60s, it was one of the most profitable sector in the book industry. So true children's literature started off with the magazine L'Oiseau Bleu, uh, which was launched by educator and priest. So you have to remember that Quebec uh, was uh, profoundly religious in the 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, mostly Catholic, and they were really influential, Catholic were really influential in education, in politics as well. So that magazine contributed to the development of children's literature and to making children author and illustrator well known. So I'm going to try and see if the link will work to show you that, um, no. Okay, so the magazine L'Oiseau Bleu is all online. So you can actually, I can send you the link and you can just Google L'Oiseau Bleu and you can see everything from the 20s. They've all digitalized it so that you can actually look at what kind of story were published for children at that point. So the Catholic Church was very powerful in Quebec for a large portion of the 20th century. Under its protection, there were many books published the church was encouraging publication of books that were, of course, promoting Catholic values. Children's in Quebec, uh, children's literature in Quebec is closely linked with the church, with Christian youth leader. In 1926, a law that was voted, the Chocolate Law, by the Département de l'Instruction Publique, which is the education ministry of today, and it recommended giving Canadian literature as book prizes, and the government adopted a regulation requiring schools to reserve 50% of their book purchase for Canadian books. So until the Second World War, European children's literature represented a large portion of the market in Quebec. With the beginning of the Second World War, it was much harder to get books, to import books from France, mostly from Switzerland. So Quebeca, Quebecois publisher took the matter into their own hand and decided to start publishing their own books. So that period during the sec after the Second World War to the 60s was a golden age of children's literature in Quebec there was, because much more was published than before that. But then in the 60s, uh, the book prize were abolished. There was a slowdown in publishing. So in the 50s, there was about um, 10 publishers who were publishing children's literature. By the end of, by 1970, there was only two remaining that were still publishing children's literature. So one book um, that was published in that period in, um, in the 60s was uh, Surreal 3000, Quatre Montréalais, 
en l'an 3000. And I'm going to read the quote because it's cutting a bit. The first and for a considerable time the only Canadian science fiction for children was by the French Canadian writer Suzanne Martel, Surreal 3000, translated into English as The City Underground. So this book was re reprinted many times. Um, I think the last time was 2003, but it's still hard to find. Is science fiction. It's about a boy who lives under, have you been, anybody's been to Montreal, heard of the Mont Royal? So there's been a big catastrophe sometime in, I can't remember which year, but then everybody had to go live under the Mont Royal. <coughs> Sorry. And they created a new society and they've been under the Mont Royal for about a thousand years. So they lost their hair, they don't have beard, they don't have... And one boy somehow find out that you can still breed outside. He does go out ab above ground and he find out that there's other people living above ground. And through this discovery and, and a friendship with a girl that lives above ground, there's a relationship that develops between them and he has to break the law of his own society to help her, her, his new friend. Um, have you read it in English, Judy? Yes, I have. Was it well received when it was translated in English? Yeah, it was. It was. We had very little science fiction here. So um, I read, so it was written in the 60s. I read it in the 80s, still loved it. I haven't seen any kids that have read it lately. But I think it's still very, very interesting. Unfortunately, Suzanne Martel died in 2012, so she passed away just a few months ago. So if ever you read French, you can actually read an article about her in Le Relu. So Le Relu is, one of, is the only magazine in Quebec that focuses solely on children's literature and children's culture generally. So, and they have an article in the latest issue on Suzanne Martel. So back to history, um, we're in the 70s and there's only two publisher where there was 10, 20 years before, but now there's only two publisher publishing children's literature. So something needs to happen or else Quebecois children's literature is just gonna die. So what happened is that Communication Jeunesse was founded, which is a non-profit organization which promotes children's literature um, and their help really helped publisher get back into publishing for children's literature. Le Relu was also founded in the 70s um, and it's published three times a year, still published today and there isn't uh, many teacher librarians at the elementary level in Quebec. I mean I don't think I've ever seen a, a children's uh, librarian in an elementary school in Quebec. There's some in high school but not in elementary school so those magazines are mostly um, read by teachers and they're the one who are promoting children's literature and reading in the schools. So there was um, mostly young and talented illustrator that brought new energy to picture books. Um, one of them, I'm actually gonna skip ahead and come back to this one. One of them was uh, Ginette Enfus who did um, a series with Gigi, uh, most books before Gigi, most little girls were well behaved, they were well dressed, they were really nice, and Gigi was completely the opposite. She would fight with her friend, she was never neatly dressed, she was not well behaved, she was exuberant, she was funny. And this book, La Cachette, which was translated as Hide and Seek, um, was just beautiful. It was, um, there's three characters in the book. There's Gigi, of course, and then there's a stuffed animal, and there's the reader, because right from the start, Gigi addressed the reader and said, okay, I'm bored, what can I do? Oh, you could play hide and seek with me. So, and of course, the reader says yes, and when she, they turn the page, she's hiding somewhere, and we go through all the rooms in her house. Oh, no, you can't go in my parents' room, of course, so my mom would never let me go in there, so of course I'm not hidden there, so you just have to look at them. Once again, I read that book as a kid, loved it. I read it to kids as a teacher librarian a few years ago, and from K to two, they really liked it. Um, and what's really nice, because they look a bit old, they wouldn't pick these books on their own, because they have like an oldish kind of cover, but they would like it when I was reading it. But then they reprinted it in 2009. All new design, new illustration, and republished them. So they're much more popular with this new and more modern 
color. So of course you shouldn't judge a, bu a book by its cover, but we all do it. So I thought it was interesting that um, they did that. And now I'm gonna go back to this because I'm gonna talk a lot about collection. And I know that for librarians, a collection is not what I mean when I talk about a collection. So I'm gonna take a minute to just tell you that publishing in Quebec for children work with what we call a collection. So it's different from a series. A series has the same character in all the books and you follow the same character at different stage of their life. A collection is either all about the same, all the same genre, so there's all books in science fiction will have the same kind of cover and you'll know that by looking at this cover what you're gonna read is a sci-fi book, for example. Or it could be about age, so these books in particular that collection is for six to eight year old. So for example, Dominique et Compagnie, which is a big children's publisher in Quebec, has at least four collections, Roman Rouge, Roman Lime, Roman Vert, Roman just means novel. And then within one collection, you can have different series with the same character and also just random books that have a different, completely different character. So if you hear me talk about a collection, it's not a collection in the library, it's a collection, it's a way of publishing. And they usually have like a similar look. Like if you look at that, this is a collection for young adult and they all have that kind of bend and the side is always easy to recognize as well. And then same thing for Roman Jeunesse, La Cour Péchelle. And I remember talking to a girl who had done um, French immersion in BC and she was telling me all the covers of those French books are so boring. And I thought, what is she talking about? Because <laughs> what I like as a kid, was that I could look in the library and find or find the book that I knew I was gonna like right away because I could recognize them because all the covers were similar. But for her, for, her, for her, it was the opposite. It was boring because they were all the same. So I think it's just the way I was used to see them like that. And I never thought of it as a boring. I thought of it as something reassuring that I could know, I knew that I would like these books because they were in that collection that I was familiar with. So I'm gonna go to, <coughs> um, so if Gigi was one of these books, La Cachette, the hide and seek book, was one of these picture books that really broke the rule and brought something new in children's lit. This is one for YA, so Le Dernier des Raisins. Raisin is a very hard word to translate. It was, the, the book was actually translated as The Big Loser. So a raisin is someone that is a bit shy, never know how to act, will do stupid things. So I don't know if loser is the best translation, but that's how the title was translated. And a many uh, researcher academics saw that book as year one of a new literature for adolescent. It was a turning point. It opened the way to realistic novel in Quebecois, YA literature. So it's about a boy. His name is Francois Goujon. He's an adolescent and is the He's not a hero, I mean, he's the main character, he's the protagonist, but he's just not a hero. He has a big nose, he has glasses. Um, he's in love with a girl that he's known forever, but he's just discovered her now. And he's really, he's too shy to talk to her. So it's really the, the realistic fiction where he addresses the reader, and he's really like you and me, like he's just one of the guys. He's not a superhero, it's not fantasy, it's not science fiction, it's just the everyday life. And it's really funny, um, and it was also reprinted, like the Gigi books, the one by Ginette Enfus. They also made like a new, and they, Raymond Plant died in 2006, and a few years later they decided, because there was more than one book, it was a series, there were four, three or four books, and they decided to um, reprint it as an anthology so that the four books would be together. For the 20th century, so I've been talking about, um, I mean, 21st century, for the t um, what are the new trends? And I'm gonna pick your brain at the same time so that you see if you've seen the same trends in um, English literature as well. So what they've been doing, and I've already mentioned twice, is that their publisher are reprinting classics. So, in the 80s, I read Gigi. Now I have a daughter, they reprinted the book. I'm gonna buy it and give it to my daughter so that she can read it. Um, these books, Les Inactifs, uh, was a sci-fi uh, series written and in the 80s and 90s by Denis Coté. It was about a hockey player 
a guy who was just from the common people, was chosen when he was a kid to become a superhero, a super hockey player, and he's really good, everybody loves him, but then he's facing a new challenge. He has to play against robots, and the interesting thing is that it's happening in 2013, so they're reprinting these books. So they already did it in 205, like this is what I read as a teenager. This was reprinted in 2005, and they're doing an anthology of the four books together, so that whoever read them as a teenager in the 80s, 90s, is gonna be interested in buying it. I think it's gonna interest new reader as well, not only parents, because it's very well written, it's an interesting sci-fi, um, it's a dystopia kind of story. Um, but they've done it with this one, they've done it with the Hazelin that I just spoken before, and they've been doing it with a few series. I don't know if you've seen that in English Canadian publishing, are they coming back, not just reprinting, but bringing a series of books together, reprinting it, giving a new page, new design, so that it's gonna be, it's gonna get a new life, because the kids are not taking them, because the cover looks old. So I don't know if you have, if you've seen that in English Canadian publishing, but this is, I mean, it's not like everybody's doing it, but it's quite, it's a trend that I've been seeing in the last few years. And then story, stories about social media. Um, so I used to try to stay away from Facebook, I can't. I used to try to stay away from texting, and I can't. Emails, I don't know if anybody never writes email. I, have no, I don't think I know anyone who doesn't at least have one email address. So I think it's all part of life. And in the last five, six, ten years, both in English and in French, it's been coming into, instead of the old media, the book, getting translated or transmediated into the new digital media, it, it happens, but it also happened the other way. So the blogging, the texting, the emails are getting included in the literature. So this is a few examples. Just from, I was reading the latest issue of Le Relu and trying to see, so are this, these new way of writing, the blogging, the emails, is it, get, is it coming into YA and children's literature? And there's, this is just a few examples. So Blog de Namaste um, is a series and it's, all, it's a girl who writes, it's a diary book, but it's in a blogging format. Um, and this one in particular, I'm not a big fan because there isn't that critical reflection or, so when I was writing my diary on paper and hiding it under my bed, my little brother could find it. But this, there's like a million people who could find it. And there isn't that reflection on how dangerous or our, yeah, you have to think before you put something online. And this is not, because this is a quite a delicate story. It's a girl and her best friend tells her that she's in love with her. And the, the woman, the girl who's blogging, is actually putting that online. So it's not even her secret. It's someone else's secret that she's putting online. So I think it's, the, and there isn't that critical idea that, well, you shouldn't be doing that. So still, I mean, the, the blogging is there. It's in the literature. And there isn't that critical reflection. Um, Textomachy is a very uh, recent one. And I've only read the first chapter. And it's really interesting. It's a, a woman who's giving birth and the first chapter, and she's texting, texting as she's giving birth. And at some point, it gets too painful, and she throws her phone, her husband catch it, and then he throws it, and they lose it somewhere in the action of the woman giving birth. And then when all is done, the woman's like, where's my phone, where's my phone? And the baby has the phone, is holding the phone in his hand. So they're saying that this baby's born texting, and that's the story of this man looking back on his life. And it seems, I haven't read the whole thing, I'm getting into it now. It seems that it's really critical about texting. So there's more of that critical view of those new social, new way of communicating. Hackerboy is again a blog. A blog um, and it's a boy who is trying to defend naive people that are getting um, ripped off, that are getting, their money is getting stolen because they promise you that you're gonna get this uh, fantastic medicine that's gonna help you do whatever you want and then you send your money or your credit card number and you never get anything back so he's the one who's hacking them trying to save people before it happens and then Louis is a story about a love story on Facebook and how there's this reflection on when you put something on Facebook it's not a private thing it's a public element as well and then Le Mystère des Jouels 
barn is about geocaching. So I've never done any geocaching where you uh, look at the GPS coordinate and then you find something in a cache. And so this one is about that. So, um, and I was wondering, I've been looking at some books using blogging, emails, and texting, and I found a lot, not a lot, I find a few American, but haven't seen any Canadian books um, that have been using the blogging, email, texting. So I don't know if you've seen, if you ever think of one, I'll give you my email, email me, I'm looking for something. Because I have a, f a, a few examples in French, but I can't find Canadian one. There's a very um, popular one, American, which all, is all in texting. Thank you, I couldn't remember the letters. So I found a lot about this one. There's lots of controversy about this one, which was really interesting. I haven't found that much about these books, any controversy or anything. So if you have anything in Canadian children's lit, young adult lit, let me know. I would be interested. Um, oh yeah, I got the cover for There's Tumaki. So. This one is clearly one for girls, and this is a bit younger, like it's a middle reader, and then this is more for adolescent. Informational book. So um, this is informational book. Uh, nonfiction is not a very big thing in Quebecois publishing. I think it's because it's really expensive. <laughs> if you make the color, if you make it a nice book, it's quite expensive. So. There's a few things. There's lots of translation, actually. Not a lot, but there's a bit of translation. For example, um, I was looking again in Le Relu, and then in the last uh, issue, there was 16 informational books that were reviewed. This magazine is mostly about reviewing books, so they review everything that has been published throughout the year in Quebec. So 16 uh, informational books were reviewed, and then eight of them were translations. Scholastic translates a lot of their translates a few of their informational book. Bayard Canada is another publisher who does it. And there's a small publisher in Manitoba called Des Plaines, which also translates some books. Um, but they're, they're actually a bit boring. Most of these books, I was looking at the topic, I'm sorry, not boring, just not very original. Like it's about North America, about countries, about uh, getting shots. Um, about the natives, and they're not very original, very well done. Like, I don't know if you know about their round table, the Vancouver Round Table Informational Award. These books would never be um, nominated for that. They're not that original, really nice books that you see when you go to this. But there's still a few um, publisher in Quebec that publish interesting things in the informational book, and this is one of my favorite. The publisher is called Michel Quintin, and this series is about all the animals that you hate, there's a book about one of them, for sure. And the kids love them. There's cockroaches, lobster, grizzlies, uh, moles, crows, all of them. They're usually black and white. They also made some colored one, hardcover colored <coughs> one. Therefore, they say seven to 10 years old, but from kindergarten to grade six, seven, the kids just love them. They're very short and they're very dynamic like there's information written by a veterinarian Michel Quintin himself who's a veterinarian and the editor there are a uh, really cool drawing made by what's his name Sempar and then Alain M. Bergeron who's an author writes speech bubbles so it's a trio writing these books and there's just a very cool dynamic and really really funny and the kids love them some of them don't read the information at the bottom they only read the speech bubble but there's a very dynamic element and the kids just love these ones and um, this one from another publisher, La Courte Echelle, is a, a newish series, I think. Those are the first two ones, so they just started in 2012, 2013. And there's also about animals. For younger kids, probably f um, age five, six, seven. Uh, le ver is wor the worm, and then la mouche is the fly. And it's the same kind of spirit. They're using the animals, they're using anthropomorphism. Um, they're the speech bubble, and they're funny. They're just giving information to a funny kind of setup instead of using the image, the photograph, and the very serious kind of layout. And this brings me, because this series um, that I've just shown you about uh, the animals is written by Elise Gravel. And Elise Gravel um, won 2012 Governor General Award for illustration with this book, La Clé à Molette. Um, 
I'm trying to remember how to translate la clé amulette in English. A wrench, I think. It's a tool to, um, I'll show you. He probably gets one. So actually, Elise Gravel, oh, that's it, that's a clear mullet. There we go. <laughs> um, I, Elise Gravel is really interesting. Um, this actually, she won the Governor General for this one, but it's, it's not my favorite of her uh, the favorite of her book. She, is, um, she has a very good humor and sense of the absurd. She's really, um, she paradised the world of adver advertising and fashion, and she creates fake, fake magazines for adolescents where the ads are all about, so look how silly that can be. Look, So it's very interesting. This one is also about consumerism. It's a little, I was going to say a boy, it's a little rabbit. Actually, he goes to the store to buy something to fix his bike, but then he goes to the store and ends up buying something else because the, the guy at the Mega Mart just tells him, oh no, you should buy this. And he gets back and he got something completely new, like, um, oh, a fridge which is also a hat or something like that. Like, so, and he gets back and like, yeah, I haven't fixed my bike. So he goes back and then buy something else. And so the, the, the reflection and the way she shows it is really interesting, but I don't, it's not my favorite kind of illustration. Um, she has a different style, but uh, she's done very interesting books. Um, so this is the one I was telling you about, Nunush Magazine, which is a fake magazine for teenager. And her father is François Gravel, who is an author. And he's been doing a really interesting thing on the etymology of words. So he's reflecting of what, where words come from. So this is Cocorico is for younger kids, and then Schlinks is for older. And they've made a book together, which I think is really interesting. Father, daughter made Le Guide du Tricheur. This is interesting, so I don't know if you like board games and card games, but the premises with this book is like, well, you know, board games are really boring. So if you have to play because your friend likes them, at least you should win. So Trisha is the little guide to cheat. So he's giving way, so if you're playing Monopoly, that's how you should do if you win. So if you have to play that really bad, boring game, at least try to win. So he gives way to when, of course, it's tongue-in-cheek and it's really interesting. So this is one of the newest book I have read. And then translation. This is my little um, personal interest because I found out when I moved here that I had read um, Forbidden City by William Bell and never knew it was a translation. I started reading it in English. I was like, hey, I've read this before. <laughs> so there isn't this awareness, I think, of translation in Canada. So there isn't much translated, actually. I don't know, have you guys ever noticed that you were reading a translation, something from French or for any other language? Except for, what's the name? Robert Munch. Yeah, Robert Munch. Oh, yeah, Robert Munch. He's translated. Uh, almost like if he published something in 2012 in English, it's 2012 in French right away. So if you're Robert Munch. And if you're, um, what's the guy who wrote Frankenstein? Um, oh, Kenneth Yeah, he's been translated really quickly as well. I don't know if you read um, this, the, the latest book of Kenneth Opel, latest book, but some of them are translated very quickly. And then others never get translated, and I don't quite understand what, how it happens. So, from French to English, this is um, a research I was doing uh, last year. YA literature, I looked in the last um, 20 years. It's hard to define YA literature, so it's, it's a bit of an, a gray area, but what I could find as young adult literature, realistic fiction that was translated in the last 20 years, there were four books. So there might have been some in the last, because um, the last one is 2009, Pieces of Me, and all of them were translated by Suzanne Uriou. There were a few other ones that could be qualify as um, YA, but there's very, very, very few translation in YA literature from French to English. There's more from English to French. So for example, in picture books, and once again, I was working with Le Relu, looking at what has been reviewed and translated. So this is only from the last issue. So for four or five months in 2012, um, those picture books were translated. So Bonne Nuit Canada, so I don't know if you recognize some of these books. 
the first name is the author and the second one is the translator actually. So first one is about Canadian geography, then about hockey, um, then this is about the environment, this is about hockey, Sidney Crosby, big goal in the Olympic Games. Um, this one is really interesting, Jin Little, uh, published by Scholastic. It was published at the same time in French and English. And Jean, um, the illustrator is Geneviève Côté. It's a great book. It looks really, really good in French and in English. I mean, it's exactly the same book. So that's very rare, rare that they would publish the same book in French and English at the same time. And then Rubber Munch, of course. And this is about dinosaurs. So <coughs> I'm going to say a lot of it is about Canada. A lot of it is, a lot of it is by Scholastic. Um, and I still don't understand how they choose what is translated. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it does not make sense. And I mean, the Bonne Nuit Canada is interesting. It's one like they go good night to Saskatchewan, good night to British Columbia, they do all the provinces. But I don't know why this one was translated and not another one. So I'm still trying to figure it out. Same thing, those are novel and chapter book. And because, like for example, Aka Mamour is Vicky Vansico. Um, the book has been translated, and I have to talk to Vicky to see, did you ask for it to be translated? Did they ask you if you wanted them to be translated? How did they choose your book? Do you have any say in that? Because I've read her book, it's really interesting, but I don't know why they picked this one in all the novel that Scholastic publishes, why this one was picked. So, uh, Nora McClintock, all her books are translated by Urtubis. It's always the same publisher. She's very well, um, she's mostly translated most of the time. This is um, a book, the Scholastic series, all their Dear Canada and things like that. So this is one of the latest one that has been translated. I just got it. I'm reviewing it um, for Le Relu and I got it in the mail t uh, yesterday. So all this, this book in those Cher Journal and all the other, the Dear Canada are translated almost right away. Um, what was I going to say about that? And then um, there's one publisher in Quebec called Pierre Tissard who has a collection made entirely of translation. It's called Deux Solitudes. So I don't know if you ever heard that expression. It's about that lack of communication, of understanding between the two official culture to official language in Canada. So that's how they call that um, collection. So it was started in 78, and it was really about making English Canadian author known to French reader because they were not known. Um, they usually choose a award-winning book, but not all the time. And that's, I read a Forbidden City, Shandai La Cité Interdite in that collection. That's how I love those books. I really, really enjoy them. Kit Pearson, I read all her book in translation when I was a teenager. So this is how they look when I was a kid, and this is the new design for the last five or six years. Yeah, my two books. So this is one of the latest one that has been translated. They're also um, And In the Morning by John Wilson, which was translated in 2007. Uh, there You Are by um, Joan Taylor. I haven't read this, that one in English. And Boy Oh Boy by uh, Brian Doyle that was also translated. So those are the three, um, the last three ones that were translated. And a bonus, because I always like to talk about, to pick an author and illustrator that I've liked and to finish with. And you might know him, Philippe Béa. He's done um, a bit of illustration with Canadian publisher as well. He's very well known in Quebec. It has this really cool, um, I was going to say almost naive kind of style. He's a very, very nice guy, a gentleman, very, very interesting. And uh, lately in the fall, he won a prize um, at one of the, a book fair, I think in Montreal. And he uh, received his prize, said thanks, and then went back to his seat and came back on the stage and asked for the mic and said, you know, I went to a big, um, bookstore called Renault Bray, it's a big, it's a chain in Quebec, and he was looking at uh, one of the shelf, it was written Canadian author, and there was one or two books um, that he knew of Quebecois Canadian author, 
and all of the other books were Walt Disney books. Disney books. So he said, you know, we should be careful. Like he just did a little spiel saying, you know, if you want, you should promote Canadian because this is a very, the Renaud Brie is a very good, a very big bookstore. It's a big chain. But what Philippe Béat didn't know it was that his the owner of this chain of the Renaud Bré was in the audience and asked to talk to him after that. And they had a bit of a fight and the guy ended up taking out all Philippe Béat's book from all the bookstore in Quebec. So there was a big uproar. All the author and illustrator were for him. Uh, a lot of independent bookstore also said, you can't do that. So it was a very, very interesting um, time where politic and that uh, came into children's. Like, you like, we like to say, oh, children's, it's just, it's just about book, but it's much more than just about books. So I thought it was very interesting that he didn't say this bookstore is awful, you should never go there. He said, you should be more careful. You should promote Quebecois and Canadian literature. You should be careful with what you do. And then the owner was just mad at him. But anyway, his books are great. He's a great illustrator. He's an author illustrator. He does. Um, illustrate for others, but he also does his own books. So this is just um, little poetry rhyme that he's done, and the illustration are always very interesting. And he does some kind of collage, something where he use different, uh, he put paints and then glue stuff as well on top. And then I like to speak about Charlotte Gingra. She's the one who wrote Pieces of Me, but she also um, published this one, Guerre. Uh, it's her most recent YA book. It's about a family. The father goes to, uh, is a soldier, and he goes to Afghanistan, and it just breaks his family apart because the mother misses him. She can't take care of her kids. The kids have to kind of take care of themselves. There's the older daughter who's a teenager, and it's kind. It's written like a um, almost like a diary, and you have the two. The yeah, three voices. You have the little boy, the, the older daughter, and the father also talks. So you have the, this three ways narrative that is very, very interesting and very. It's the most touching books I've touching book I've read in the last year. So the, I, it hasn't been translated yet. So if you read French, you can read in French. But I hope that it's going to be translated. And that's it. Thank you very much. I hope I was going to tell you if you have question while I'm talking, you can stop. But we can do question now if you do. Thanks. I, I think we do have questions. Uh, thank you very much, Jean Bia. Thank you. And um, I'll start with questions. But we do have uh, you know, a good amount of time Kay. for questions and discussion. And our, my first question is. Um, I know that English Canadian publishing uh, issues or publishes about up to 500 new books a year now, um, approximately. Mm -hmm. And I, I had always heard that in Quebec it was parallel, that it was approximately the same amount in French. Mm -hmm. What do you know? Um, I was going to, the last numbers I. Have and I can check to be sure. I was going to tell you it's about. I was going to say about 450 or so, between 400 and 500, depending of the years, give a, give or take. That's what I would say. Um, yeah, I don't have the numbers here, but it, it's about the same thing. For a long time, like when France, we for a long time we imported books from France, and even when my parents were kids, they were not much published in Quebec. But now. Um, there is very, very interesting publishing done in the Quebecois, pub in the Quebecois publishing, and there's, yeah, probably quite a few hundreds, like it's about parallel with Canada. And there is, the numbers that I don't have are the ones um, for the smaller publisher, fr francophone publisher in the other provinces. So they're much smaller. I've seen few, a few books from all of them. But I don't know what the amount would be, how many books there would be from those other publishers. By comparison for everybody, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to guess how many books the U.S. Oh. has over here? <laughs> children's books? Or yes, children. oh, no, yeah, children's books. Children. We're just talking children's books. Uh, yeah. Not, 
5,000. Oh, English, yeah. Good, 5,000. It's, <laughs> it's, it's more like 6,000. Wow. Which is interesting. That's a lot of books for children. So I and was. Mm -hmm. I was talking uh, a few years ago, Pierre Pratt, who's a Quebecois illustrator, uh, came to the roundtable, the Children's Literature Roundtable, and he was also at the Writers and Author Festival. And he was telling me how he was starting to try to get um, more work in the States because um, it, was, it was hard just in Canada as an illustrator. And he, he had moved to Portugal. He was also teaching at the same time. So Pierre Prat is a very, very productive and a very well-known illustrator. And even him was like, yeah, just with Quebec and even with Canada, it's not enough for me. He had to teach. He had to try to really. So it's not, it's not easy for, it's not like you make a big amount of money being an illustrator or an author. <laughs> yeah. Talk a little bit in response about how Canadian literature is often a little bit conservative in terms of its topics, and it takes longer to sort of explore new ideas in Canadian literature. And I was wondering if Quebecois literature is a little bit more um, adventurous, just when you're talking about the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. of the I think so. I, I actually, um, Pieces of Me um, by Charlotte Jengra, there is a scene. Um, place where the girl is talking, it's a YA novel, and she's talking about, it, it's about female master, masturbation for adolescents. And I was showing that to a group and everybody in, in, in Vancouver, and a lot of people thought, ooh! I was like, okay? <laughs> and this is the kind of book I read when I was a teenager, and I never thought it was edgy or weird or not like, it was just the kind of book I read. So when I moved here, it's just when I started talking with people. I'm like, there is, I think, especially related to sexuality, I think there is more liberty that I would take that I done for YA novel. And even for picture books, I think a lot of the illustration that are done in Quebec are more dynamic. They, they try more things. But there's lots of Canadian uh, illustrators that are getting really, really interesting. But I think it started in Quebec first. There was one... I can't remember when it was published. It was called Petit Zizi, so which means little, pe little penis. And I was showing that book, and people were like, ooh, really? <laughs> it's, about, it's about a little boy who's in love with a little girl, and there's another boy in love in, with this girl, and they decided that whoever is going to pee the furthest is going to be the <laughs> one who's going to be able to, who's going to be his, um, his boyfriend. So her boyfriend, I mean. And, so it's really cute and really, really fun. But then I remember you saying a few years ago, oh, no, English Canada is not ready for that. And I thought, what? <laughs> really? And, and it is a picture book. Yeah, it's a, a picture, picture book. book. It's for, yeah. And, well, not ready for it. No, there's no English language yes. Canadian publisher would picked do it. it up to translate. Mm -hmm. and it, it was translated in many languages around the world. Yeah. And finally, there was a radical Jackson American English language. Oh, publisher really? Translates it. Nice. I don't. I don't know what. I have to look at. Yes, I don't know what it was though. I have to check what the title is in English. Yeah, because Zizi, Zizi is like a. That was uh, this. Yeah, I don't know how. How would you? It's not penis. It's something else. Anyway, so yeah. So I think there is more, especially in relation to sexuality. Um, I remember talking with um, Sarah Ellis. I was talking to her about the books, her books that had been translated in French, and the woman who had translated them, who, um, if I'm not mistaken, was Michel Marino, who wrote The Road to Schlieffe. And so Sarah Ellis had read some of uh, Michel's work, and she was like, oh, her work is really edgy. And I thought, really? <laughs> so there is really, I, th I think it's just, yeah, it's just different. It's just the way people have been doing things. Is I think it's different in Quebec, and it, it might explain when you go back to translation why some stuff is not translated because it's not picked up by publisher. It's not the kind of book. It doesn't fit in whatever the publisher is publishing, mm -hmm. and the, the other way around would be the, would be true as well, I guess. It's true. That, um, what you just said is exactly what the publishers I spoke to. Uh, about four years ago said, mm -hmm. which is that uh, they chose not to translate as many 
French language children's books into English in Canada mm -hmm. because they felt they wouldn't sell because the cultural um, atmosphere and beliefs, What's social and yeah. sociological beliefs was quite different from their general market. It was very restrictive mm -hmm. attitude, I thought. But I think the problem is the less you're exposed to something, the less you're interested in something different. So um, I think in countries where there's more translation, kids are used to being faced with something that is different and you kind of get comfortable with the difference. Like you get, I don't know if you can get used to the difference, but you get used to reading something that is different and it becomes just a routine. Oh, okay, you, this is from, it's different from what I've, I've been doing, but so the less you translate, the less there is interest in translating, and the less people are going to buy the books. I was going to, um, I have a, a weird relationship with translation. When I go to kids' books and I see all these English books translated in French, I'm always like, why don't you have more of the original French book? Like the book from France on Quebec, but a lot of the books that they have are translation from English. And I'm like, why? Because that's what the parents know. So if you're buying a book as a parent and you don't speak French and your kid is in, is in French immersion and you recognize the author, you know, oh, of course, I've read this in English, I've heard it. So it's easier for you to buy it. But if it's a completely unknown author, it's harder. So that's why... And I think translation is really, really important, but like if you can read it in English, why read it in French? So the translation that should be there are translations from Swedish that you can't read in Swedish, but you're going to read it in, in English, but not. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's my little spiel about translation. I love, I, I do not read. Yeah, there's some exception, but if I can read a book in its original language, I like to read it in English or in French, but I don't read the other way around. That's just me. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Yes? Um, what about um, illustration? Mm -hmm. Is there a certain style that you've noticed maybe in picture books? You mean if there are, um, <coughs> if there are in, in illustration? Um, no, I will say I'm, I can't, I, I'd love to answer that question, but I've been focusing a lot on YA in the last few years. So except my little bonus like Philip uh, Bea or books that I've looked specifically, I haven't been uh, reading a lot of picture books. It's really hard to get um, books in Vancouver in French, except if I want to buy all of them. Um, I've been trying to get books at VPL and then they say, oh, we don't have it and we don't know of any library, any libraries who have it in Canada, so you can't get it. I'm like, what? I'm sure there's a few libraries in Quebec that have that book. So I've been having a very hard time looking at books. I've been focusing on YA because I have to put my attention somewhere. But, um, no, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. I'd love to. I have a, I have a thought. Yes, please. Um, it isn't entirely my thought. Again, in the interviews I did for the mm -hmm. book I wrote, uh, the, uh, the people I interviewed who actually addressed the question of Quebecois publishing and illustration said that English language publishing, uh, there is a much more representational, realistic style. I'm paraphrasing, but this mm -hmm. is what they, about 20 yeah. people said to me. And French language publishing in Canada, uh, Francophone publishing, they said was much more experimental and surrealist and risk taking mm -hmm. and more like European children's book illustration. And they said the English language was like Anglophone illustration from England and the United States and some cartoon comic realism thrown in. Mm -hmm. And they said that was, um, because of that, some English language translators weren't translating picture books from Quebec because they felt the song was too different. Or oh. if they wanted to publish a picture book, 
in an English language published picture book originating in the English language. Um, if it was a surreal text, they would go to Quebec to look for the illustration, which is just very interesting that they all, 20 separate people approximately, share the same perception. Mm -hmm. And building on to that a lot, I've seen like Philippe Bea, I've seen his, his illustration in, uh, from English publishing and a lot of illustrator from Quebec are able to work with English publisher because they're able to read in English. Mm -hmm. The other way around doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I, I have yet to meet an illustrator, English speaking illustrator who's work, had, like who has been working with a Quebecois publisher because they cannot read French. I think we have an advantage because we don't really have, I mean we do, but most of us do speak English. No, I'll rephrase that. <laughs> a lot of the illustrator author, and if you want to be able to work outside of Quebec, you have to speak English. The other way around is not true. Like you can go anywhere in North America almost and speak English and you won't need, like you can work in the States, you don't need to speak French in North America. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the illustrator are really lucky for that in Quebec because they can work with all the publisher and a lot of them have been doing it. So Pierre Pratt worked in the States and um, they've done, who's the, what's the name of the guy who did Jabberwocky? I can't remember his name. The lead, yeah. Um, the, it is, it is <laughs> yeah, sorry, no. I mean, the picture book. <laughs> there was yes, Stefan Jurich, who's an amazing illustrator. Thank you. It was Louis. Yeah, you're right. But they made a picture book, an illustrator made, and it was Stefan Jurich who made an amazing, uh, very weirdly interesting book. Anything else? But like the seventy, and I'm wondering if there's a sort of need for more integrated Canadian literature to create Canada as an international society, or does it lead to this really strong regionalism um, connected literature? Yeah. Um, you know, I, Judy was telling you I w I'm working on my PhD on um, f francophone schools. Um, and within those schools, we have kids um, that are multilingual. So they go to a francophone school, they're in an English environment, but they speak Spanish or an Asian language or an African language at home. <coughs> so they get this very multicultural kind of culture. So I think it's very hard to think about, to think now of Canada of only French and English. We're having a hard, so I think there's, we need to open up even more. We're having a hard time opening up to those two languages. We're having a hard time with the communication between the two languages, but I think we have to open up even more to native uh, publishing from native publisher that are not, that I don't see much. It's hard, like it's often smaller publisher and it's hard to see them, like I was gonna say in mainstream, like in bookstore, like on the first, you enter and you get something that from a native author. So and other languages as well. So I think there is a need to think of Canadian society as what we want to do with children's publishing and how we want to integrate all those languages and the multicultural. I'm fighting for the French because I'm from Quebec and I speak French, so that's just, it just seemed logical to me. But I think there's a need to opening up to even something larger than just French. The first step for French and English, if I go back to your original question, I think the, the, the awards winner should all be translated. I mean, if they won an award in French, if they won an award in English, I think they're wordy, like not, oh no, kids are not gonna, there is something there. It's not just like, oh, this book is gonna work for kid in Vancouver. If it got an award, it works for many kids, either, I mean, not just the Governor General Award, but quite a few words should be translated. I think that would be the first step, and it's not done. They used to be more, um, grants and things for translation, but I mean, there are cuts everywhere, not just in literature, but in everything. So it's getting harder and harder, but I think there should be, and with the digital, the possibility to have eBooks, you don't have to print 5,000, you have to translate it and then whoever needs it. So it's, it, I think there's possibilities, but there has to be a will and I don't know who could how it could come to be, like how, 
would the Canadian government say, okay, all the Governor General Award are going to be translated, not just in children's literature, but in adult literature as well, because it's the same thing for adults. Like, there's lots of adults in Quebec who are unable to read in English and vice versa. So I think that would be one step, but... If we were the Prime Minister of Canada, <laughs> that would be our, our first... <laughs> that would be my first law. Every books are going to be translated, yeah. I, I think I'll bring this to a close yes. with... Tremendous thanks from all of us. Thank so you very much.